Miami and Texas A&M in a rematch in South Florida. Aggies won the meeting last year 17 to 9. But history says this year might be tougher for the Canes. Miami has lost five straight to ranked teams from outside the ACC. That dates back to 2017. But A&M has its own hurdles. The Aggies on a six game road losing streak, the longest active road losing streak in the SEC. So let's welcome in now Carter Carrolls of Gigum 24 seven and Chris Stock of Inside the U. Guys, both of these teams undergoing a facelift with coordinators, starters. So Carter, start us off here. How different will this year's game look compared to last year's? Well, yeah, I don't even know if you can take anything from last year's game, which was you know, quite the offensive struggle uh, for both teams. Uh, for AM in particular, you can just compare this year to last year. I mean, obviously they brought in a new coordinator, a new play caller in Bobby Petrino, but they also uh, didn't have Evan Stewart in that last game. He was suspended. Uh, Noah Thomas, who was another uh, star for this team this year at receiver, uh, he didn't play an offensive snap. He was kind of a true freshman, kind of kind of working his way in. Didn't really break out until the the really this off season. Uh, and then, I mean, from Miami's standpoint, they also uh, Xavier Restrepo was was out that game. They've got two new coordinators uh, this off season. So a lot of changes from them as well. But uh, yeah, trying to compare it to last season, it's it's almost like you can't even take that much from from this that game last September. And obviously the big difference is Connor Wigman. You know, the, he didn't play in that last game. Texas A&M looks a lot different. Miami's going to have to prepare for that pass defense. We'll get more into that. But I just think from a Miami standpoint, the two new offensive court or the offensive corner and defensive corner have changed. In terms of some personnel, you touched on Restrepo. Also, Miami's leading receiver right now. Four catches, 79 yards in the opener. Colby Young did not play in that game. He was a Juco transfer last year. He, still come, he was still coming on before he eventually produced. So certainly that's another weapon. Miami also, their tight end position looks a lot different. Without Will Mallory, he had six catches in that game. They had seven total in the game. And last week, Miami had one catch from a tight end. I think that's going to be something to watch for. So certainly a lot of differences on both sides of the ball, both teams. Miami does return Tyler Van Dyke. Another difference, this game is in South Florida. And certainly Miami's hoping to get back to their winning ways at home. They did win last week, but that snapped a five-game losing streak at home. They're hoping for a good crowd. But certainly all across the board, as Carter mentioned, there's a lot of things that you can't really take from last year because so many differences on both teams and both sides of the ball, really. Uh, well, keeping up with the theme of differences here, Canes now have a more run-centric approach this year with Shannon Dawson. They averaged almost seven yards a carry in their opener last week against Miami, Ohio. Now they're up against a stronger A&M front. So, Chris, how do you see this matchup playing out? Miami wants to run the ball. However, and they were able to run the ball pretty good against A&M last year, 175 yards in that game. Miami goes for 250 against the Red Hawks. They have three running backs primarily that they want to go to, and two of them are new. You know, Mark Fletcher, the freshman, and A.J. Allen, the transfer from Nebraska. Don Cheney Jr. got those carries late in the game. So I think Miami is going to primarily go with the three guys. Henry Parrish played in the game last year against the Aggies and did run the ball well. Miami wants to run the ball. They keep talking about being physical up front. However, I think it's going to be Miami's passing game. If they're really going to get this win, they've got to be much better than they were essentially last week, but also last year against the Aggies, uh, even though Tyler Van Dyke is returning. But Miami wants to run the ball. You touched on the Aggies defense being a little bit better from what we've seen so far. Yeah, and piggybacking off just what, what Chris said, I mean, A&M's run defense is, has been a big focus this offseason. They rank 122nd against the run uh, last year and – had a lot of inexperience, had a lot of injuries uh, up front that, that kind of played a role in that. But if you look at DJ Durkin, the defensive coordinator, uh, just his career, he has not had a top 80 run defense since 2015. So it's a, it's a big question going into this season. I think they look a lot better against the run against New Mexico. Now, again, it's, it's New Mexico, so we'll see what it looks like against better competition uh, in Miami. But you'd like to think these guys who were – true freshman last year, you know, guys like Shamar Stewart and, and Walter Nolan, and, and even a veteran like McKinley Jackson, who was hurt for a lot of last season, having those guys more experienced, more healthy, I think will take this uh, run defense uh, up, up another level. And as far as the secondary goes, um, another another question going into this offseason, losing Jalen Jones, your top cornerback last year, 
losing Antonio Johnson, another really good uh, player in the secondary. Uh, they returned to Monty Richardson, who, who's got about 50 starts under his belt. Uh, Tyreek Chappelle's a three-year starter. But the guy who really popped in this last game against New Mexico was the Boston College transfer, Josh DeBerry. He had team-leading 10 tackles. He had an uh, interception. He had a sack. He had a pass breakup. He had one and a half tackles for a loss. Uh, he was really everywhere the entire game. And that's somebody to watch in this game as far as just making an impact, not only uh, as, a, as a secondary player, but also against the run. Because you look at this defense, he may be one of the best tacklers uh, on it, even though he's at the cornerback position. So definitely a player to watch in this one. All right, you guys both mentioned Connor Wegman. His only road start last year was pretty miserable against Auburn, but he's 3-0 and as a starter since then, including the five-touchdown win against New Mexico last week. He's also now got Bobby Petrino calling plays for him. So, Carter, what are you looking for on this side of the ball? Yeah, I think A&M's found the answer at quarterback in, in Connor Wegman. Um, you know, you, you mentioned the Auburn game. That, that was a, a crazy game where – he, he was without his top three receivers in that game. But the, the games where he had Evan Stewart and Moose Muhammad healthy against Ole Miss at the LSU last season, he looked pretty dang good. And it, against New Mexico, he looked pretty dang good. Five touchdown passes, which was a record for an A&M starting quarterback in a season opener. He had four of them at halftime. Uh, and he's a guy who can make every throw on the field for you. He's someone who can uh, be mobile, he can run for you, he can move around in the pocket. Uh, but under Bobby Petrino, a, a big focus has been exploiting mismatches and what he calls feed the studs. That's that's kind of his big philosophy. And, and it means pretty pretty simple, pretty simple stuff. Uh, get, your, get to the ball, to the uh, playmakers in space and exploiting those mismatches. What you saw against New Mexico was them really attacking uh, their secondary deep uh, and outside the numbers. Uh, I do wonder if, if that'll be a focus against Miami. I know quarterback is kind of maybe the concern for them. Chris might be able to speak to that. But uh, I do think when you've got receivers like Evan Stewart, Noah Thomas, Moose Muhammad, and Nia Smith, uh, you're going to see a lot of deep balls. You're going to see a lot of uh, uh, the passing game uh, from Connor Wigman and, and especially because they have a quarterback who can do it now. Without question, I think this is the biggest factor in the game. If Miami's going to be able to contain the passing game of the Aggies, I think that's where this game's going to be won or lost for the Hurricanes. Cornerback position is going to be very interesting. They didn't. They struggled against the pass last year. They had two corners go on to the NFL. They do have Cam Kitchens back, safety, All-American status from last year. So, But we will see at cornerback. If they're going to be able to guard those guys, in particular, Lance Gidry, the new defensive coordinator, speaks a lot about the cornerback's ability to be able to guard the ball downfield along the sidelines. He feels like that's an important part of the game for a defense. And I feel like that's that you're going to see that in this game. If they're going to be able to contain those Aggies receivers, as you mentioned, Miami's got three corners in particular, that a little bit smaller, smaller corners to Corey Couch, Jaden Davis, and also Daryl Porter. They do have a couple big guys that they can go to, in particular the matchup with Noah Thomas and, and Damari Brown, or Devontae Brown, his brother Damari Brown, a freshman. Devontae will probably get that first crack, six foot two. They also have a, a Vanderbilt transfer, six foot one. Jadis Richard could also be used in that matchup, particularly with Thomas, you know, the bigger receiver. So we will see. Miami's got a lot to prove and be able to defend the pass. And again, I think that's where this game's going to be won or lost for the Hurricanes. All right, we've named a lot of players. Now we need someone who's going a little bit under the radar to watch in this game. So, Chris, who should we keep an eye on? I think from a Miami standpoint, let's stay offensively. Tyler Harrell, wide receiver, transfer from Alabama. One catch, 14 yards in the opener. Wasn't a big guy in terms of targets. Just the one target. Played in the second half. Has a lot of speed. I, I don't think he's going to be in that top top group of receivers. But when 15's out, th out there on the field, you've got to be aware of him. I think, again, playing at home, he has the ability to have, have a big catch. He's got that downfield speed. I think look for that. I think that can really ignite the crowd, really give the Miami offense some juice. So pay attention to Tyler Harrell, wide receiver with some big play potential. Yeah, and I, I keep talking about the run defense for Texas A&M being a big focus. And it sounds silly to, to, to talk about this guy as an under-the-radar player, but uh, I'll, I'll just go ahead and name 
Walter Nolan as that guy. <clears throat> He's a sophomore. He, he worked with the, the backups against New Mexico, but he, he saw plenty of time. And really the big thing with him is the, the, the looking more quick, looking more slim, just looking more ready to play college football. When you're a true freshman defensive lineman, I don't care if you're the number one recruit in the class, it can be pretty tough to, to deal with those grown men on the offensive line. But but now that he's got a year under his belt, had the experience last year, and he's kind of cut that uh, that weight that he needed to cut, uh, this is someone I expect not just to be impactful against the run, but also as an interior pass rusher type. I think he's somebody that can get to the quarterback. And you saw him against New Mexico kind of flash that quickness, that that speed. He made a, a play to the sideline that I thought was very impressive. Uh, so overall, I think if you're looking at A&M defending the run, uh, McKinley Jackson is a big focus, but I think Walter Nolan stepping up and making that second year jump will, will be critical to them improving. All right, Carter Carrolls and Chris Stock, thanks so much for joining us with this preview of A&M Miami. And for more, Remember to check out and subscribe to Gigum 247 and Inside the U for all your recruiting and football news and analysis all season long.